week's episode is brought to you by Audible. To browse their catalog of more than 150,000 titles and download the free audiobook of your choice, go to yhtv.us forward slash audible. Sign up or log in with your Amazon account and start enjoying your new book today. Hello and welcome to YHTV's nominated show, Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 103. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Dr. Woolman. And greetings to you, Christina. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you see, you know it's a good day when we start with a little chuckle, right? Oh, it's always a good day, and we always start with <laughs> chuckles, I think. We should sometimes interview Chuckles the Clown. I think there's a clown out there that's called Chuckles. Let's that do be, it. That would be a my fun show, interview. <laughs> <laughs> that's on my show, and you just have to come and be a guest, too. <laughs> well, that, that's a good point. Gre- <laughs> greetings, everybody. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide, along with Christina today, as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy, searching for optimal health. And today we have with us a very special guest, Dr. Gerald DeRosa. He's an internist and nephrologist, and I'll talk a little more about him in a moment. Uh, But Christina, in case anybody wants to get in touch with us. Well, of course, at any time during the show, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment simply by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. Or you can call us directly at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. We'll definitely be sure to uh, post your question or comment to our special guest or to Dr. Woolman and get back to you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Thank you, Christina. That's great. So as I said, uh, Dr. DeRosa, he's an internist and a nephrologist. He's also the regional divisional head of nephrology in the Fraser Health Authority in British Columbia. And I always love talking about this. I always like to say something about royalty. And he's the, <laughs> <laughs> I don't get, get to say that often, but he's the current head of the Department of Medicine, as well as the clinical teaching unit director at the Royal Columbian Hospital. It's so Canadian. It's so Canadian. <laughs> you know, it's it's always very exciting to me. I love talking to healers. And as you know, and anybody that listens to this show at the end of the show, I always thank my teachers and my healers. So when we get someone who is a healer and a teacher, very special show for us. So I would like to introduce at this time to all of our guests, Dr. Gerald DeRosa. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, Gerald. Hi, thank you very <laughs> much for to inviting show. me today. <laughs> We've been trying to invite you for quite a while now. <laughs> My schedule gets a little busy sometimes, so uh, yeah. Well, it's good that when, I have when, times. When, when you're dealing with royalty and the Royal Canadians and things like that, I and guess basketball. That's, that's right. <laughs> You've got to include basketball for the stress release. Yeah, I was thinking this would be the the toughest time of the year to have an interview with you during the during the NBA playoffs. <laughs> well, my my team is the Lakers, so um, since they're out of the playoffs, it actually hasn't been as stressful as other times. <laughs> <laughs> it frees you up. Yeah, it frees up my time because they didn't make it this year, as you guys well know. So, yeah, uh, lots more free time this last past few months. <laughs> Maybe a while before they make it again, depending on some. Uh, uh, next year's training and and physical processes, et cetera. Yeah, we yeah, shall see. It sounds like the Clippers have more issues than the Lakers right now. So that they do. <laughs> uh, maybe someone in Canada can buy the Clippers team, or I think they just got an offer, but I'm not sure what's happening there. So, Gerald, uh, as the medical guide, I usually like to tell our viewers where we're going today. And first, we'd like to get to know a little bit about you and how you got interested in medicine, things like that. We want to talk about your training uh, to help people that are trying to decide on a career, what they might have to go through to become you. And then we want to talk about uh, the kidneys and kidney health. Uh, Where are the kidneys? What do they do? What do we need to do to take care of them? And if things do go wrong... What, what's out there for us. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. Excellent. So let's start. How, when, why did you get interested in medicine itself? And then maybe you could tell us why you then chose internal medicine and then even more specially into nephrology or renal medicine. Sure. 
Well, my father will probably always say that my mother brainwashed me into doing medicine. <laughs> um, but, um, but what I remember is when I was very little, I actually had, uh, it was very interesting. I had a mole growing underneath the toenail. And uh, what happened was my whole toe turned underneath the nail turned black. And I guess it was almost kind of uh, like a pre-malignant lesion. So I actually had to go to the hospital and have that nail removed and have surgery on my toe. And um, I actually found that to be quite an interesting experience. And I think Mm. that was the first thing that got me interested in medicine and following medicine. Um, Wow. And then I think... From there, you know, I had some I had some friends whose fathers were physicians, and so sometimes I would ask them questions um, and see what their job was like. One of them was kind enough to bring me to the hospital one time and show me around, uh, oh, which great. you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to do that nowadays, but uh, mm-hmm. because of privacy issues and stuff. But uh, in the old days, they would just kind of put a lab coat on you and bring you into the office and let you kind of uh, observe, which was really uh, fascinating for me. Um, You know, I think in school, I was always pretty good at math and science and those kind of subjects. So um, when you go to university, you kind of have to give a thought of what you want to do in your life. And uh, medicine was definitely up there on my list. Um, But uh, you you also have to plan ahead. And it is hard to get into medical school sometimes. You have to have backup plans and all that. So um, what I ended up doing was thinking that I would want to be involved in the healthcare field to some degree. So I did a uh, mathematics statistics undergraduate undergraduate degree. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, my my plan was going to be do, to do actuarial sciences if I didn't get into med school or biostatistics and uh, healthcare research. Um, and then I was lucky enough to apply for medical school after third year and getting into medical school at UBC, and then so went to medical school. Nice. And then in medical school, I, you know, it was interesting because when I was a kid also, uh, we had a family friend who was a surgeon. When I was 12 years old, he used to take me into surgical procedures with him, and that was part of the original experience for me also. And you're right, that would never happen anymore. But that was such a vital part of uh, my career path. When we were in medical school, it was always the the students that were really the brainiacs that went into internal medicine. Uh, were you one of those? Um, well, I, yes. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I tended, you know, there's a whole bunch of people, as you probably experienced in medical school, a whole different bunch of personalities. And there's certainly people who are the surgical types Correct. and people who are kind of the internal medicine types and then people who are more the psychiatry types. And you kind of, start to differentiate yourself as you go through your clinical rotations. Um, I found the operating room to be uh, actually a bit repetitive after a while. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, some of my colleagues, they, they loved it and they still love it to this day. I really found the most exciting part of the medicine was solving the mysteries. And uh, I think when you get into a situation where you want to solve mysteries, you're looking at either doing um, internal medicine for adults or pediatrics for children um, because you're kind of uh, the specialist after the family doctor sees them who then is trying to solve more complex issues. And I always found that to be kind of intellectually challenging and satisfying. So that's what led me to uh, internal medicine at that time. Um, and, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, so, yeah, that, that always seems to be the, the path that people take to get into internal medicine, the ones that want to solve the problems and intellectually think about things more deeply. What then, so you looked at the entire body in internal medicine and focused on the kidney. What was it about the kidney that appealed to you? Yeah, so you're right, Glenn. You know, for the first three years, you rotate through every organ system. So you do the kidney, you do the heart, you do the GI tract and everything. And you you have to get good at all those because you first get licensed as a general internist um, so that you can practice um, all forms to a certain degree. Um, Your options beyond that is you can be a general internist, which um, allows you to kind of see everything, but not necessarily be an expert in any one field. And I think um, what... I really found important was that I really wanted to know one field better than everything else and be kind of the, um, I guess what you say is the end consultant for that field. Mm. Uh, nephrology for me, 
there's a lot of numbers in, in kidneys. Uh, there's acid-base problems, and actually you can measure someone's kidney function by blood tests. So when you do interventions or you hold medications or you do other treatments, you can actually see fairly quickly if your treatment is um, having the right outcomes by redoing the blood tests. And right, a lot of medicine... Yeah, and a lot of medicine is very subjective, right? You can ask a mm -hmm. patient, is, is your shortness of breath better? Is it worse? And, and we try and quantify that sometimes with, you know, how many blocks can you walk or things like that. But it's still sometimes tricky to really get the subtleties, whereas um, in nephrology, oftentimes it's, it's a very numbers-based in some situations. So you can really um, get a bit more objectivity in what you're doing. Interesting. So you stayed true to yourself in terms of numbers and statistics, uh, trying to balance all of the things that you like. I, I like that. The training for that. So you go four years of medical school, uh, first four years of college, four years of medical school. And how long was your internship and residency? So, yeah, I, um, I was lucky enough to only have to do three years of, of uh, undergrad and then I did four years of medical school. Um, and then the internal medicine is three years. And then nephrology is two more years after that. Um, so that would have been five years of residency in total. And then you keep training and you keep taking courses and staying current. So it's a, it's a lifetime process for all of us. It, it is a lifetime, yeah. I, I actually went on to do a master's degree in healthcare quality and healthcare delivery. So that was another year. But um, you're right, beyond that, um, depending what country you're in, there's uh, generally uh, rules and regulations that you have to complete a certain number of uh, continuing medical education credits per year. For us, it's 80 per year. So you have to go to conferences or read journals or have um, meetings and, uh, and really keep yourself up to date because medicine changes quite rapidly. 80 per year, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we have... Uh... We have 50 credits per two years. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, we have 80 per year um, for four. You guys are much smarter years. than us. <laughs> <laughs> maybe but, it just takes us longer to learn things, maybe. <laughs> but is that just in one area, or is that in each of the different areas that you've studied? So the, the 80 credits or the 80 hours would be in internal medicine. Internal yeah. medicine it, alone. They don't necessarily have to be specifically nephrology. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, you, you also are a teacher, and do you only teach the uh, post-grad students, or do you teach medical students also? No, so we have uh, medical students uh, at all four years, uh, as well as then residents through all their years of training, as well as nephrology fellows and, uh, and internal medicine fellows. So we, um, the hospital I started at has become a very uh, big teaching site for our province of British Columbia. And so we have, they split up the medical school recently, instead of having it in the old days when I did medical school, all 120 of us would sit in this uh, classroom for eight hours and just listen to lectures. Uh, they've actually split people up so that they go to different hospital sites and start their education more problem-based and in, in a hospital setting. Mm. So we have 16 of our own students uh, going from year one all the way to year four. As they get more towards the later years, they do much more clinical work, whereas in the first two years, it is a lot more theoretical work um, to get the basics. And then... Um, and then they enter their residency, of course, and we teach uh, a whole bunch of different residents internal medicine, uh, not just the ones who will end up being internists, but even if you're going to be a radiologist or a psychiatrist, um, there is a, a need to learn some internal medicine as it relates to your practice. So we teach all those uh, residents as well. In your process right now, you're a teacher and you do patient care, correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, I'm a clinician first and foremost, um, right. but because we are an academic center, we basically, even in my own office, my private office, we have signs up that say that we will, that you will probably see a trainee um, because we're always kind of integrating that into it. So the trainee will often see the patient first and then review the cases with us. And then we kind of go back to the patient and discuss it with them. But then also uh, during that time in the process of reviewing um, we would teach the student or the resident uh, about the case and then even at, at the end of the day sometimes uh, discuss some topics. So um, that would be kind of on top of what we do as our clinical work. 
What, what do you find the most interesting uh, in teaching and in clinical care, and what do you learn from each of those? Well, I think in clinical care, the most interesting thing are the, are the really complex cases that, that, um, that stump people. Um, I think they're scary sometimes, but they're also, um, they're also very challenging. And by challenging you, you know, it keeps your interest up, uh, makes you read more, makes you really think about things. Um, so that's what I enjoy. I enjoy seeing the complex things. Um, in terms of teaching, you know, I think teaching is <clears throat> such a valuable experience. I think you only become very good at understanding things when you're able to actually break it down and explain it to other people at different levels. And also you get a lot of, you get to learn how other people process information and mm. it's quite it's quite variable actually. So you actually have to develop different styles for different people and how they learn and how they, you know, what level they're at. You can have more complex discussions. You can have more basic discussions. So I think really being a teacher makes you a better doctor um, because then when you go talk to your patients, it's a very similar process. Some patients have, you know, a very good understanding of what's going on and some patients, um, by virtue of maybe their level of education or things like that, um, you may have to break it down a little more simply for them. So because you have that practice, I think it makes you a better just doctor in person um, when you treat people. Uh, that was a beautiful uh, analysis there. I really like that. I want to get now into the reason we're here today, the kidney. We want to learn about it. So in a few minutes, first explain to us where the kidney is and a little bit of the anatomy, and then we're going to go into the function of the kidney and we're going to uh, expand from there. Sure. Um, this is where a picture would help, I guess. But um, so basically your kidneys are quite far back, um, farther back than pe most people would think. So, I mean, if you basically just feel where your hip bones are in the back um, and then just rate, you know, probably go up by about five to 10 centimeters, that's where your kidneys are kind of located, you know, under your rib cage, um, but in that back area. So a lot farther back than most people think. Most people think they're kind of in the front of your belly. Mm. Um, they will then attach through a small tube called a ureter. Uh, these tubes will run through then from, from the back area to the front to where your bladder is, which will be just, you know, right in the front of your, um, of your belly down low. And then, of course, then the bladder will then have the urethra, and then that's how you would get rid of the urine. So um, a lot of people wonder whether they're having kidney pain, um, and it does get a bit confusing because um, it is in the area where all your back muscles are and your spine is. Mm -hmm. um, mo most of the time, I tell patients that even if they have kidney disease or kidney problems, uh, it's probably the pain is not from their kidney because there's very few things that actually cause pain in your kidney. Um, so a lot of times that's just more back pain. Um, but, um, but if you did have kind of very severe pain in that back area that was unrelenting and wasn't related to whether you were walking or resting or anything like that, you would think about things like kidney stones, kidney infections, um, stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Excellent. I, I was pushing uh, as you were doing that. I was finding my back hip bones and I was trying to go through that whole process. How about you, Christina? Were you finding your kidneys? No, I was just thinking of kidney stones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. I would think that you would be thinking of kidney pie or something like that. <laughs> well, you have to add the steak in there too. <laughs> uh, that's, that's right. Uh, that's an interesting process. Have you ever uh, had a steak and kidney pie? Chair? Um, well, not steak and kidney pie, but I mean, we used to have liver and kidney and, you know, from a Chinese family, basically anything that you can cook, you would eat. Yeah. Um, all the organs. Yeah, all the organs. I tended not, I tended to be the least adventurous um, <laughs> of my family. So um, I would not eat most of those stuff, but uh, my brother does and my parents do for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be interesting if that was the way that you chose uh, your career which which one you like to taste more <laughs> <laughs> I really like the heart I think I'll be a cardiologist <laughs> All right so we know where the kidneys are uh, let's talk about the function what do they do for us Yeah so um, there are three main things that the kidneys 
does, you know, one of the first things I tell patients, and, and that's probably the one that gets referred to me the most, is the uh, metabolic regulation. So they basically clear toxins from your body um, and regulate some of your electrolytes, your potassium levels, your calcium, your phosphorus, your sodium levels. Um, so that's a big uh, fundamental component of the kidney. And when it fails, that's when patients usually get quite sick and when you need to do things like dialysis. So the first thing they do is the metabolic regulation. They also do volume regulation. So obviously, they're one of the major ways to get rid of fluids in your body. So if your kidneys fail, then you might see fluid buildup, you know, swollen ankles, uh, fluid in the lungs, shortness of breath. Um, those are the two main functions that people are generally aware of and that lead to problems. However, the kidney is an interesting organ. It also um, is responsible for two hormonal uh, processes. So one thing that it does is it makes EPO hormone. And people have generally heard of EPO if they've heard about uh, Lance Armstrong and the Tour de France and blood doping. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that people were doing is the healthy athletes were injecting EPO into their body to raise their red cells um, so that they could uh, have a higher oxygen carrying capacity and do better. Um, so the kidneys actually make EPO. And when patients' kidneys fail, they start to make less EPO, so they get quite anemic. So a lot of my patients with significant kidney disease, we give for them EPO injections. Um, the other thing that the kidneys do is they activate vitamin D. So if your kidneys aren't working that well, you often have problems with vitamin D, which can lead to uh, bone issues and things like that. So we often have to give people very special forms of vitamin D when their kidneys get to a certain point. So they kind of do all those three things, metabolic regulation, volume regulation, and hormonal function in your body. Really important. I want to, I want to diverge for just a few moments uh, on an interesting, hopefully, discussion uh, you mentioned that you're Chinese, and in Chinese medicine, the function of the kidney and the kidney is very important in a different realm than the way you see it. Have you ever had discussions with Chinese medicine physicians related to kidney chi or um, anything to do with the kidney, and what kind of thoughts do you have about that? You know, it's very interesting. I, I haven't had any conversations as a, as a physician um, there's really a separation between kind of um, the traditional medicine that we learn and kind of um, well, what people call as the alternative medical therapies. Um, though I think that some in the curriculum, they are trying to introduce that. Um, the only experience I really have with Chinese medicine is as a child um, being treated with Chinese medicine and uh, going to the Chinese doctor and getting the herbs poured and the, and the, and the soup boiled. Um, mm. and, and you're right, they do kind of, they do their assessment and they have a sense of whether, you know, they try and, I guess, categorize what organ is, is not performing up to capacity at the time is my understanding. But mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have a, a very sophisticated understanding of, of how they actually do things or how they, they make those judgments. Uh, Jer, one of the things that we really stress on this program is prevention. And you talked about some things before about the things that can go wrong with the kidney metabolically and hormonally, and these present themselves in pretty bad ways with renal failure. What I want to know now from the point of view of a nephrologist, when I go to the health food stores or I go to uh, some of the different types of healers, I read about these kidney boosting teas and supplements for kidney boosting and different juices that are kid for kidney health and improve kidney health. What's your process in terms of advising our viewers about how to protect their kidneys and keep them healthy? Is there anything we can do? Yeah, no, this is, uh, it's very important to, to me, um, to talk about things like this. And certainly maybe I'll break it down by talking about what um, you can do from a med from a traditional medical point of view, and then uh, and then I can certainly touch upon um, some of these uh, natural remedies and, and things like that. Um, you know, I would estimate that when my patients have kidney failure, probably eighty percent of the time or higher, it's actually something completely preventable. Um, and so that's why preventative medicine is such a big aspect of things, and that goes back to. Um, 
people and their interaction with their family physician or just their general health patterns, right? Um, by far the most common causes of kidney failure is diabetes, hypertension, and uh, cholesterol. And uh, so uh, as you may be aware, you guys have probably talked about in prior episodes, um, those things can be uh, definitely modified by your lifestyle um, and they can be monitored and uh, and uh, and be treated appropriately earlier on in the course. So from a general lifestyle point of view, there's very good evidence about uh, lifestyle modification and managing hypertension. So people would say that if you eat the right type of diet, um, certainly one of the big things is avoiding a lot of salt in your diet, but there is actually prescribed diets. One of them is called the DASH diet. If you you can people can google it and it's just d a s h and it's a diet that actually seems fairly practical when you think of it it's you know uh lots of fruits lots of vegetables uh lots of fiber less kind of heavy meat less uh high carbs and uh you know that's theoretically supposed to be healthier for your body and prevent uh hypertension um regular aerobic exercise um their usual recommendation is half an hour a day every day or some people like to do one hour every other day. Um, and that has been shown to actually um, reduce systolic and diastolic blood pressures. Um, other recommendations that people have been given is uh, a lot of people could stand to lose a little bit of weight. And it's amazing what a little bit of weight loss will do. Even 5, 10 pounds can bring your blood pressure down by 3 to 5 points. Um, finally, other lifestyle situations, you know, smoking is not good for your health, obviously. Um, and uh, alcohol in moderation is supposed to be quite reasonable. And some people think maybe a glass of wine is protective, but certainly higher alcohol intake is, is not good. Um, so with that in mind, you know, I, I recommend those, you know, when people come to me and say, do I, do I really need to take a blood pressure pill? What can I do? I say, well, we can try this and see what happens and then reassess. Um, now that being said, sometimes even the healthiest person can't escape their genetics and a lot of things like high blood pressure, diabetes are, uh, there is a strong genetic component and they do run in families. Um, so I've seen very healthy, you know, people with a great BMI who do all the right things and they still have elevated blood sugars or high blood pressure. Um, in those scenarios then, uh, you know, getting on top of it and uh, getting the blood pressure under control, getting the diabetes managed uh, appropriately, then um, there's very good evidence that would suggest that if you do that early on, that you would never get to kidney failure. So one of the things I recommend, the biggest mistake people make is when they're feeling well, they don't see their doctor when they feel sick, then they eventually go see their doctor. With something like kidney disease, it's quite silent. You can actually have quite a bit of kidney damage before you even get any symptoms. And so I often suggest that people should see their doctor at least once a year, even if you're feeling completely fine, and get an annual checkup. And that annual checkup should include a blood pressure check, um, a kidney uh, blood test, your cholesterol, diabetes check, you know, just routine annual blood work. Um, to kind of keep on top of things. That's a really good point. And I think the part that you mentioned about uh, kidney disease, for the most part, is silent until it gets to a very serious point. And that is a good reason for that. I do, I do want to ask you a question. A lot of doctors are, are starting to recognize that lifestyle does make a difference. Lifestyle changes makes a difference in many of the diseases, especially the ones that you spoke about, diabetes and hypertension and cholesterol areas. How do you, as a nephrologist, when you're working with a patient, other than just saying you need to change your lifestyle, you need to exercise 30 minutes a day, what kind of things do you do to really make your patients take this to heart, or in your case, kidneys, and do the things that you're suggesting? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, nephrologists, uh, at least, I'm not entirely sure how the system works in in the U.S., but um, in Canada, at least, we, we're, the nephrology community has understands that it takes a lot to actually educate people. So besides providing them with the right education source material, we actually have kidney clinics. And in our kidney clinics, we have multidisciplinary care. So we often have a nurse, uh, we have a dietitian, and we have a social worker. 
And, uh, you know, I think in those scenarios, uh, we work as a team to help the patient. So we have educational sessions, we have cooking classes for them, um, we have options classes, and uh, we kind of try and approach each patient individually. Some patients just need the information and just don't know how to access it, so we Mm -hmm. help them with that. Um, Some patients, you know, to be honest, they have to be scared a bit, you know, so they go to these educational sessions, we talk about things like dialysis and they really realize, you know, we talk about what their kidney function number is and what that means. And they kind of get a better understanding that this is quite a serious uh, condition. Um, The problem, you know, as we were talking about is that your, your kidneys can function or drop to 50%. And in most cases you will be asymptomatic. um, If your kidney function had dropped to 50%, it actually has to go probably below 20 30 to 25 percent to cause any symptoms and so um, that's why sometimes you'll have a patient and you'll tell them oh your, your kidneys are 45 percent we really have to get on top of this and they'll say well I feel fine I don't know what you're talking about right mm-hmm. and um, and so it's kind of multidisciplinary education and individualization of the patient's needs um, we do try and do more education we do try and have programs like walk with your doctor things like that to try and uh, um, try and demonstrate good, healthy behaviors. Um, so that's kind of, I think, generally how we approach things um, in British Columbia. I like that. Walk with your doctor. You were going yeah. to mention you're going to mention some of the uh, supplements and health foods and things like that when we look and say, this is a kidney boosting tea or this juice will boost your kidneys. Uh, you were going to talk a little bit about the supplements and the teas, the things that might be able to be out there that can help your kidneys. Yeah, it, you know, it's a very interesting subject, and it, it comes up a lot with my patients. Um, and I actually, when I did my master's degree, we did um, I did a course in uh, in critical thinking and also you know uh, alternative remedies just to understand it a little better. Um, you know, I usually start off by telling my patients, you know. Even the medication, everything has the potential to help or harm, um, and it's just a question of which one it does. Uh, even drugs, you know, they're distilled from natural substances. So you can imagine that there probably are natural substances that are helpful to your body and will help um, will help maintain your health. Um, that being said, the challenge is say, which ones are, are going to help and which ones are going to harm. Um, the kidney is a bit of a funny organ. It, if it gets damaged, it actually doesn't heal. Um, and, you know, I, I do often see patients come in with uh, pills that are supposed to heal your kidney or make it better. And, um, you know, uh, one of my responses to that usually is, if there was such a pill, obviously I'd, I'd be, you know, giving it to people to try and make their kidneys better because I would hate for them to fail. Um, so it just depends what the components are in, in the pill. Um, a lot of them are just natural substances that are thought to be pr- to promote your health. Uh, some of them are just vitamin supplements, and I think that those are good things. Um, you have to be somewhat careful, though, because if the kidney function is not so great, uh, sometimes there are certain substances that you should not take more into your body. So I usually ask them to bring it in, and I go over the ingredients with them, a lot of times I won't be sure. It'll be something like milk thistle or something, which I'm not aware of any damaging um, components. But sometimes they'll have things like magnesium or aluminum um, or heavy metals. Mm-hmm. And generally, if your kidney is problematic, I, I tell them to avoid those sort of things. Um, you know, I, I think most of the treatments are fairly benign. And um, it's just hard to know if they would really uh, help or not. I usually just tell the patient, um, you know, we'll make sure it's not harmful. Uh, certainly it could or could not be helpful as long as it's not too much of a, um, impingement on your pocketbook or anything like that. It's not unreasonable for you to try it and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, it might make you feel better. Uh, I want to move into the, uh, thank you for that. That was very good. I want to move into some problems with the kidney and, uh, some treatments. And I think one of the easiest and simplest, but one of the most painful things that uh, I ever see in the hospital uh, was someone suffering from a kidney stone. Mm. Uh, what what can you tell us about a kidney stone, just briefly, but mainly in if somebody has 
been diagnosed with kidney stones? Is there something they can do uh, to prevent them in the future? Yeah, there, there definitely is. I mean, um, my patients who have had kidney stones, they generally do say it's one of the worst pains they've ever had. Um, you know, so, some of my male patients have compared it to childbirth, but I tell them that's a dangerous <laughs> thing to do that. So uh, their, <laughs> their wife usually smacks them if they're there. In the room. Uh, so That's um, why it's painful, because of what they say. <laughs> um, actually, funnily enough, a fair number of my colleagues have got kidney stones um, because one of the biggest things for prevention is fluid intake. And, you know, you're busy, you're running around, and you don't drink a lot of fluids during the day. And uh, there are actually, regardless of the type of kidney stone you make, three things that you can do to try and prevent kidney stones. The first one is, uh, is increase your fluid intake. So if you can increase your fluid intake up to three liters a day and really promote your urine output, um, that drops the uh, chance of making further kidney stones because the, what a kidney stone is essentially is just crystals in your urine that come together and form a stone. So if you make your urine very dilute by drinking a lot of fluid, then really the concentration of the crystals will be a lot lower, and so you won't make as many stones. Um, the other, excellent. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the <laughs> other general recommendations is that uh, some of the breakdown products of protein. Um, do uh, promote kidney stones. So we usually recommend that people don't uh, try and reduce the protein intake. Now, that being said, it kind of depends where you are. Um, you know, in the West Coast, we tend to not have as much of a problem with meat intake and having a lot of red meat. People eat kind of a balanced diet. They have fish, they have chicken, things like that. Though if you go to more of the central, uh, central Canada, um, like Alberta, kind of those prairie provinces, and I'd imagine if you go into you know, America, like some of those certain states, um, you know, people eat kind of red meat like twice a day, every day, right? And that's quite a large uh, amount to break down. So um, we generally recommend a little bit less protein. And uh, also salt seems to be a particle that uh, helps form more kidney stones. So I generally recommend to patients, even before I do any analysis or anything, uh, increase your fluid intake, decrease your salt intake, and maybe watch your protein intake. And those three things are supposed to decrease your chance of having a recurrent kidney stone by about 70%. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. So, yeah. so when we speak about protein in this case, you are mainly referring to red meat as opposed yeah. to chicken or fish or in a case of a vegetarian, um, yeah. beans and legumes. Beans and yeah, yeah. yeah, generally when you look at people who have the kind of quote unquote high protein diets, it ends up being a lot of red meat, you know, steaks and, you know, uh, hamburgers and all that sort of stuff. So um, generally if you have a varied a uh, diet that's a little less than that, it generally seems to be okay. Um, beyond that, you know, if someone keeps on getting stones, if we're lucky enough, sometimes we catch a stone, we send it to the lab, and that tells you what the stone is made out of. Um, we also do things like a metabolic workup where we get someone to, it sounds very odd, but it's, we do a 24-hour urine collection where you actually uh, pee in a jar for a whole day and you bring that to the lab. And we check for particles in that in the urine sample. And based on the particles that you're making, if you're making any excessively, we can kind of go back and look at your diet. So one of the most common stones are calcium oxalate stones. And uh, oxalate is, uh, is generally in certain types of foods, especially nuts. So I had one patient who was getting tons of stones. We did a metabolic workup. He had uh, very high oxalate levels. And basically, he had peanut butter once or twice a day. Um, and so we cut the peanut butter out of his diet. And uh, he certainly had far less stones than he had before. So you can actually, it, it's interesting that way, you can actually get some data and then give them specific recommendations based on what they eat um, to try and prevent the kidney stones. I want to ask you a quick question and then move on to some serious things. There are a lot of uh, bodybuilders and weightlifters and athletes out there that are trying to supplement their protein and, and take massive amounts of protein to get bigger and stronger. Are they doing damage to their kidneys? Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, the general thought is that that is potentially damaging to your kidneys. Um, your kidneys do have to filter out all that stuff. And um, the thought process is, is that um, taking you know high amounts of creatine and things like that um, can make your kidneys overwork. Um, 
there is actually some evidence that if you have some chronic kidney disease, that you should modify your protein intake and not to the point that, because you don't want to be malnourished, but you should also watch it, watch it and not have a high protein intake. And so I think extending beyond that, um, the bodybuilder kind of culture, um, it, uh, it, it is thought that it puts your body through a lot of unnecessary strain in some of your organs, like your kidney, then through uh, more activity than they should have to go through. Um, you know, I have seen some very sick patients. That being said, sometimes in the culture, there's also a lot of other things they take. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to kind of differentiate that from whether right. it's just the high protein intake or, you know, especially if they're high level competing people, sometimes they take diuretics all the time right. um, to make their muscles look better. Um, and then of course, sometimes people will be tempted to take things like anabolic steroids and uh, obviously those are not good for your health. So let's move into, uh, the most serious problems with the kidneys, which would be renal failure, either acute or chronic. Most of the time it's chronic, but when somebody fails, when somebody has kidney failure, first tell us, you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, Tell us the kind of symptoms in life that they have, and then what kind of treatment do we have for these people? Yeah, so the, uh, the symptoms of kidney failure, as the kidney starts to fail, they're fairly subtle, and, and um, that's why it's tricky for patients to know, because they don't actually locate to where your kidney is, or they're not related to when you go pee. So um, generally, as the toxin level builds, you start to feel less well. So common complaints that patients may have are uh, fatigue, uh, their, their actual sense of taste changes, and they often complain that food that they're eating tastes somewhat metallic-y. Mm. Um, they, yeah, that, that's kind of a classic one. If food starts to taste strange, you have to think about kidney or liver failure. Um, a if, surgeon would never think that, would they? Yeah, no, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> um, the um, uh, itchiness, because the toxin buildup, uh, nausea, then as it gets worse, things like vomiting, um, muscle cramps, uh, then difficulties with sleeping, difficulties with your bowel movements, and then fluid buildup, of course. So those are the things that you would look out for. Uh, you know, I often tell patients, it it's a, sometimes can feel like you have the flu and it never goes away. So you just feel kind of tired, fatigued, you feel bad all the time, and you don't feel like eating or anything. Mm. Um, so in, in a chronic setting, it's, it's very subtle, so you can kind of work through those symptoms. In an acute setting, it can happen quite quickly. And more often in an acute setting, people are then um, not able to get rid of fluid properly, so they're very puffy, and they'll notice that. Is their face is puffy, their legs are puffy. One of the first places they get puffy is, um, is your ankles, because, and it usually happens at the end of the day. So, um, you know, you're standing upright and over time that fluid that's in your body will kind of then sink to your ankles and you'll see that's where you first see what, what people call edema. Um, so if people are noticing a lot worsening swelling of their ankles and things like that, then they should get checked out. Um, when it gets, yeah. And I mean, depending on what caused the underlying kidney disease, obviously you can have other symptoms or manifestations. Um, people get weird diseases like uh, connective tissue diseases. People might have heard of things like lupus or vasculitis, and then you can have weird rashes, uh, arthritis. You can have patients coughing up blood, things like that, um, that give you a clue as to what's going on. So. All right, so now we've got all of these things, and now everyone, all of our listeners and viewers are looking at their ankles. And <laughs> think, hey, Christine, are you looking at your ankles? No, I'm just thinking about the water. Am I drinking enough water? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that's a quick, quick, interesting question. Can someone drink too much water? It would be pretty hard to drink too much water. Um, we do have some patients who have something called psychogenic polydipsia where they do drink too much water and they drive their sodium levels low. Generally, you probably have to drink about eight liters a day, um, which is very challenging to do. At some point, it actually starts tasting bad. Um, I, when I was a fellow, I went to a lab in Toronto and studied with a physiologist and he actually put us through a number of experiments to understand our own kidneys and one of them was a water loading test and he tried to get us to drink as much water as we possibly could. Um, I think when I got to four liters I actually started to feel quite unwell. Um, mm. 
So it is really hard on a general basis to overdrink, so to speak. Um, people often ask me how many glasses of water should I drink during a day or how many liters? And I think in a reasonable sense, if you don't have problems like kidney stones or anything like that, you still probably want to drink about two, uh, at least two liters a day. You know, I say, you know, six to eight glasses of water is a pretty reasonable amount to drink. Um, the only time you have to modify that is if you have problems with dealing with the fluids, such as kidney failure, heart failure, liver failure. Um, oftentimes the doctor will tell people to drink less in those scenarios. But if you don't have those kind of problems, then it's completely reasonable to drink at least two liters or even three because what will happen is if your kidneys are working well, they'll just get rid of the excess. Um, you need a certain amount of fluid to uh, you know, have bowel movements. You need a certain amount of fluid that you'll get, get rid of when you breathe and when you sweat. So you need all that essential kind of fluid gain uh, so that you don't get dehydrated. Um, the other thing I was going to add with the ankles are people sometimes look at their ankles and they think they're swollen. One of the tricks to see if it's actually edema is if you press against your shin bone and you see if there's an actual depression that's caused there, okay? Because some people just have puffy ankles, especially in the summer or if they've been on a flight. But if you can actually press down on the, on the flesh and press against your, your shin bone and there's a depression that stays there, um, then that would be more suggestive that there's some edema and fluid retention that you would want to get look, it looked into. Excellent. That's a good point. Yeah. Pitting edema, we used to... Yeah, whenever yep. I would see that, it would be, oh my gosh, we have to work harder here and this person needs a lot more help. Yeah. So we, we focused on prevention uh, because we don't want to have to go through renal failure, but those that didn't watch this show and did all the things that you said, at some point someone may go into renal failure and then their life becomes about uh, treatments. And the treatments that we have for someone in renal failure now are dialysis and kidney transplants would yep. use. Okay. So tell us about what it, what dialysis is and what your life is like on dialysis. Maybe this can influence people to be more preventive. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there are two forms of dialysis that you can do. Uh, one is called hemodialysis and that's where, uh, a patient's blood will get taken out of their body. Um, either through a dialysis line in their neck or through something called a fistula, which is a, a, a surgically created shunt in their arm. So the blood will come out. It will actually go through a dialysis machine. We'll, we'll filter the blood, clean it up, uh, remove extra fluid if we have to, and then return that blood to the patient. Um, those dialysis treatments generally take, depending what country you're in, probably um, three to four hours, uh, three times a week is kind of the minimum. Um, it is interesting because the general public, when you look at dialysis or what they go through, it's, you have to go to a facility to have the dialysis treatment three times a week. And, you know, I usually tell people by the time you drive there, get there, get hooked up, come off, um, people feel quite tired after dialysis. So, um, their three days that they spend dialyzing is oftentimes a write-off. And so it really affects their overall quality of life. Uh, now, we do have other forms of dialysis. We have some people who do home dialysis, actually. Mm -hmm. So we teach them how to um, use the machine. We fix the plumbing in their home, and they actually do their dialysis treatments at their own house. And they often do it at night when they're sleeping. Um, and that tends to work a little better. Uh, what people have to remember is that your kidneys function 24 hours a day, seven times a week. So when mm -hmm. we try and do the function of your kidneys in the span of 12 hours a week, we're not really, that's not really as physiologic as it could be. Um, but part of it is practicality. So a lot of the patients who do the dialysis at home, they actually do more dialysis treatment. They all often do six hours, six to seven nights a week. And so they get, you know, three to four times the dialysis that someone's getting in, in, in a dialysis center. And they often feel quite a bit healthier. Um, there's good evidence their blood pressure is better. Um, a lot of the younger women, they're able to get pregnant. Whereas if you're on hemodialysis in a facility and stuff like that with kidney failure, your odds of becoming pregnant are quite low. Um, so there's that type of dialysis, which is the blood dialysis with different variations on the same theme. And then, uh, there is another form of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis, where you actually put a tube in your belly that stays there and you pour fluid into your belly that, uh, that then sucks out the kidney toxins and sucks out the extra fluid. And then you empty that fluid from your belly and you end up doing that every day 
with either a machine or you do it three, four times a day. Um, sometimes people like this method of dialysis because it's more gentle, it's done every day, and um, you can do it from home. So the patients that I have doing it who are doing well, they do it from home and they come see me at the clinic maybe every two, three months. But the rest of their treatments are just home. Um, they often do it overnight with a machine so that their daytime is quite flexible. They can still work. They can still travel. Uh, the companies are really neat. They um, they have uh, satellites everywhere. So, you know, if you wanted to go to Europe or Asia or, uh, you know, I've had patients who want to go down to Vegas, they just tell the company which hotel they're going and they drop oh. off the supplies to your hotel. Wow. Uh, yeah, if you go on a cruise, you you just put the supplies in the bulkhead, um, and uh, and you can go on a two week cruise and just do your own dialysis um, uh, on the cruise. Mm. So um, so that's that that's pretty good. People tend to have a better quality of life now. It depends on your overall health status, though. Um, a lot of times, people because of their health complications, it's not just their kidneys that have failed; they have other complications, and so um, they aren't able to do the independent forms of dialysis. So then they end up doing the facility-based dialysis, um, which is probably the most disruptive on your quality of life. And then, of course, as you mentioned before, Glenn, we always try and uh, get a patient a kidney transplant. Um, it's very interesting. Transplantation medicine is kind of um, continues to get better and better. In the old days, you used to have to, it used to have to be a relative. Um, now it can actually be someone completely unrelated who has no match at all of their, of your HLA types. Um, the only thing right now that you have to absolutely have is you have, you have to have a blood type compatibility. Um, and so as long as someone has a blood type compatibility, then, um, you can do a kidney donations. So what we often try and do is try and get people to get kidney transplants even before they ever end up on dialysis. That's called a preemptive living donor transplant. Um, if they end up on dialysis, then we, if they're healthy enough, we put them on the cadaveric transplant list. Um, but the waiting list for a kidney on the cadaveric list, um, which is, you know, obviously you have to wait for someone to, to die from an accident or something like that. That waiting list is anywhere from three to seven years, depending on your blood type. Um, so you could be on dialysis for a long time, and sometimes you you don't actually end up being healthy long enough to actually get your transplant. So um, so that's what we often uh, try and do. I mean, you'll see those interesting articles now where even if your blood types don't match, people do trades. Um, they do donor chains, and those are sometimes in the newspaper and the TV shows if you guys watch like Grey's Anatomy or something. Um hmm where you know someone might have an A kidney they want to give it to their spouse who has a B uh, blood type that you know there's probably another couple that's the other way around and so what they will do is they'll they'll cross donate their kidneys just to try and maximize living donation and stuff so wow that's very cool now now let's just say for example I want to be a donor yes it's i can live with one kidney right yes yeah i mean Obviously, one of the principles of medicine is, above all else, do no harm. So um, we couldn't do something that we felt would be potentially harmful to someone else um, to save another individual or help another individual. Um, so to be a kidney donor, you actually have to go through quite a rigorous process to be screened. Um, so you can't have things like diabetes, high blood pressure, history of kidney stones, anything like that. So you have to be kind of almost super normally healthy to even be a kidney donor. Mm. Um, you know, we test your kidney function, we do ultrasound, we do all that sort of stuff. Um, if you pick the right people, the evidence is pretty good that your chance of, uh, of kidney failure or complications is not any higher than the general population. Um, now, you, you do have to be, tell people and be honest with them that, you know, obviously there are scenarios where having one kidney would be a problem uh, compared to having two kidneys. So if you donated and you had one kidney and you were unfortunate enough to get into a car accident that damaged the leftover kidney, then you would be in trouble. Whereas if you had two kidneys, you wouldn't be. Um, you know, if you had a kidney stone and you only have one kidney, it could block off that kidney temporarily and cause you troubles um, more than if you had two kidneys. Um, but I think because those scenarios are quite rare, um, that's why when you look at the overall population size, it doesn't seem to be that different. Um, so it's kind of like saying the risk is exceedingly low but, uh, of having any problems if we pick the right people. Um, but people still have to be aware that there are certain risks 
But I think that's most of the time it's balanced by the fact that you're donating this kidney to a loved one and making them healthier. And so a lot of times people are willing to accept that very small increased risk um, to uh, make someone better, you know, a, a, a child or a spouse or a parent or, or, or a best friend or something like that. So, but it is a big sacrifice still. And, you know, I'm always humbled by people coming forward to donate kidneys uh, to a loved one. Beautiful. Yes. Wow. What about stem cell research? <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. So um, I do go to the uh, usually kind of an annual meeting. Actually, the U.S. meetings are kind of uh, where everyone goes, the American Society of Nephrology. So uh, oftentimes once a year I'll come down to the U.S. And, and go to the meeting to see what's cutting edge and what's being developed. Um, there's fascinating things being done. So with stem cells, you know, the hope is one day they could actually grow new kidneys. Um, and uh, maybe even grow new kidneys from that person so that you could just put it in and it wouldn't reject then because it would be their own tissue. Um, people are trying to develop artificial kidneys, um, little uh, kind of robotic or micronized kidneys, which is uh, also quite fascinating. Um, the other thing people are doing is sometimes they are doing um, kidney and bone marrow transplants at the same time. So the problem is with uh, kidney transplants is that even if they're blood type compatible, the antigens aren't exactly the same, so we're always worried about rejection. Mm -hmm. um, and so the theory is that if you transplant the bone marrow and the kidney at the same time, then the, uh, the person would basically be tolerant to that kidney and not have to require so much immunosuppressive drugs. Because if you look at the downsides of the transplant, you know, the upside obviously is you don't have to do dialysis. The downside is that generally you have to take immunosuppressive medications for the rest of your life. And they do have certain complications, you know, a higher risk of infections, um, slightly higher risk of skin cancers and things like that. So, um, but most people would trade that off because, um, it really increases your lifespan and your quality of life quite considerably, but it's not perfect by any means. I mean, if you could grow a kidney and just put it in there and have a workable kidney, that would be um, probably the best solution. I think you've painted a beautiful picture for prevention rather than waiting to go see you for the uh, end results. I want to I want to switch to another area for a moment, just as we're coming close to the end here. Uh, you told us at the beginning that you'd been a patient before. You're a healer. You're a teacher of healers. You also mentioned that you have a master's degree in health sciences, and your focus, I know, is on quality of care and health services delivery. In a hypothetical world right now, Gerald, if you were invited to another country that was just trying to start a health system there, uh, based on all of your knowledge, what are some of the qualities that you would want to have in a health system to ensure quality of care and good services delivery? Wow. Um, that's a challenging question. That's almost like a, probably a dissertation in and of itself. Um, <laughs> so I figured I would ask that with, with 30 seconds to go. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, I, I work in a Canadian healthcare system with universal healthcare. Um, there are pros and cons to that. Um, you know, I have actually, uh, done some training in the United States as well. I, I went to the Massachusetts General in Boston and did some nephrology there um, just to kind of experience uh, another way of doing things. Um, you know, systems work is, is so complicated. Um, and you, you look at it and you say, um, what is the best uh, approach that'll be the most efficient? Um, but, you know, healthcare in and of itself is, is sometimes not efficient. Um, if you look at something like even kidney failure and dialysis, the, the treatment is so expensive that if, if you were just an economist and you didn't care about people or anything like that, you would say, well, um, which is what was done in the past when there was limited resources, they'd say, we'd only offer it to the people who could get a transplant and the other people, we wouldn't let them have dialysis. And that happens in some countries because they simply can't afford the therapy. Um, so, you know, if I was to design a system, I think the first and foremost as a healer and as a, as a person, um, I do think some universal access to healthcare is important. Um, I, I just can't see, and I, I, I can see the challenges for sure of the costs and things like that. But um, I, I don't look at you know 
what someone's finances are or a situation like that. When I treat them, I just treat them. Um, and, and that is, you know, makes me feel good about things. Um, that being said, you know, I have observed a certain amount of wastage when the, when there is no cost associated with your treatments. You know, we often have people come into the emergency department just to get prescription refills and things like that, or not necessarily often, but I have seen it happen. Um, and because when you're in kind of a more of a universal healthcare system, there's no kind of thought processes to like, what that's going to cost the system at large, right? Um, so uh, I would say that you have to have a system that melds those two concepts, is that you want to treat everyone who needs help should be helped. Um, but I think that um, that you need to impose some sort of individual responsibility on the citizens to look after themselves and also contribute to the system to make sure it's sustainable. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it is if you can, if you can afford to pay a little more, maybe you should, but now I'm starting to get into politics, so I don't do that or else. Uh, <laughs> right. But, right. uh, but I think, you know, some system where everyone can get the care they, they need, um, but they have to maintain some level of social responsibility. Yeah. I like that. I remember when I was working in the emergency department, we would have people come in for prescription refills. Not only would they come in, but they'd come in by ambulance. Speaking yeah. of <laughs> speaking of uh, abusing the system a little bit, we're speaking with Gerald DeRosa, uh, Dr. DeRosa, who's a nephrologist and an internal medicine uh, physician. He's a clinical associate professor, and it's time for a health tip. Wonder if you have something for us. Um, well, I, I think it probably relates back to... Uh, to what we talked about already is I think that if you want to maintain your, just your overall health, it's, you know, kind of healthy lifestyle habits. So uh, eating well, uh, certainly exercising and, um, and then for your kidneys in particular, drinking us, you know, probably around two liters of fluid a day, um, that will probably prevent most complications. And beyond that, I would just say, as, as I was saying before, is that even if you feel completely well, um, going to your doctor to just have an annual checkup, your blood pressure, just some routine blood tests is always a, is always a good thing. That's great. Gerald, is there anything that we didn't discuss that you would like to, uh, talk to people about, uh, as we have just a few moments left, something that you left out or we didn't cover? Um, yeah, it's hard to. It's hard to know exactly. There's so many things to talk about. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I would I would also tell people to just be careful about um, searching out sources of information without having the right lens to read it. Um, so I, you know, I will often have patients come in who have looked up things on Google and stuff, and uh, either it will. Uh, conflict from what I've been, I, I tell them, or it it may scare them a lot more than they should be scared. Um, so it's always, you know, it, it is good to be informed. I think it's great to have access to all these different sources of information, but the complexities are um, are such that you really want to be able to have a good discussion with, you know. You, whoever you deem is, is your reliable healthcare practitioner, whether it's traditional medicine or not, um, as to like how to interpret that information. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, using different sources is fine. Um, but, uh, I think that's the, that's the one thing I would point out to people. Um, you know, medicine, no form of medicine has all the answers, right? So um, I think it's just making sure that you're on top of it and uh, and that you have the right people providing you with the information. Um, one of the things that I often see is that um, is that in traditional or non-traditional medicine, people will be taking so many medications. Sometimes the best thing that I can do as a nephrologist is actually cut out two or three of their pills. So the other thing is if if you're not feeling good or you you know uh, getting a second opinion, um, that's where I've seen some things uh, fall down as well. Is that uh, is that if you're not feeling good and you're not entirely satisfied with you know how your care is being delivered, and you're not satisfied with that you're being um, you know 
that you're having a good discussion with your healthcare practitioner and stuff, if it's at all possible, I would, I would get another opinion and really try and work with someone that you're comfortable with. Yeah, everyone should have a medical guide. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a I'm great, great health tip. Right, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, very, I'm grateful to our very special guest, uh, Dr. Gerald DeRosa, for sharing his wisdom and experience with us. I'd like to thank all of my healers and my teachers for putting me on the path that I'm on and keeping me there. I like I look forward to getting together again with all of you on Magical Medical Tour again with Christina next week, where we'll search another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gerald DeRosa. And until our next meeting, I wish you all optimal health. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerald, for taking the time and honoring our community. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to finally get you on the show. <laughs> yeah, it's taken a while. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's been great. We'll have to get him on a p- panel next, uh, uh, Dr. Woolman. <laughs> there you go. And, of course, we would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're always grateful for your continuous support, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. If you'd like to contact Dr. Glenn Woolman, please uh, contact him through his site, glennwoolman.com, where I do encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath. And again, we always look forward to your feedback, your questions, your suggestions. Please give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. And until next time, namaste. Like not having a high libido, Mm -hmm. um, it's almost, well, it's the manifestation of all this, all these stresses or stressors on us. Yeah. So, so yeah, so work-life balance and career stress, stress in and of itself is definitely an impact on, uh, definitely impacts libido, Um, you know, adrenal fatigue will certainly impact libido, um, not enough time, um, not like literally no freedom in your life to really feel like you have the ability to indulge in that. 